Oh, thank you so much, Bob, um, and to the organizers at EASD, Dr. Bolton in particular, just being able to watch EASD and your amazing influence on the world of diabetes is incredible. Um, so just wanted to um, start by saying um, that I think there, it's really early on you know, in digital. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I, I kind of think of being back in business school. Um, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't centuries ago or anything like that, you know, and um, I was chasing this guy at the time who asked me, you know, do you think we should go buy cell phones? And I was sort of like, go buy a cell phone. Like, he thinks he's so fancy, you know, and so important. And I think about what that cell phone looked like, right? We think back to these flip phones and then flip forward to today, where we are with smartphones. I mean, I think a lot of where we are in providing tools, both to patients and providers, on the digital front, we're still very early on. And I think it's very easy for us as patients to get really frustrated with how things are. And I hope um, that we can just remember, you know, how early on we are. Um, so anyway, but I think that um, it's the job that I get to do is to travel all over the world with an amazing team from San Francisco watching many researchers and scientists, many people here in the room, and looking at all of the things that you have done to help patients, particularly on the therapy and technology fronts. And I think we are also, though, really at a time where we need to think more about how to coordinate things so that the patients and providers can get the most possible out of that. So you're so I have been thinking about diabetes for many years. Bob is right. I was diagnosed almost 30 years ago as an, a, an undergraduate at Amherst College. This is on the eastern part of the United States. Um, this is where right now there are basically two weather reports. You know, it's snowing today or it's snowing tomorrow. This was actually a really beautiful fall day. I remember it really well because my life changed, you know, forever this day and after. Um, how many patients are there here in the room, people with diabetes? Raise your hands. Yeah, so, that, so you know, you know, it's like you, you just remember that day so vividly, right? And, you know, who are there people who have children with diabetes in the room or parents with diabetes? Yeah, I mean, we, we all see around us, diabetes exploding at this incredible pace. But back then, I think um, we probably all felt, if we were diagnosed a while ago, we felt more isolated. I had a really textbook diagnosis and a really textbook set of complications, short-term complications. Um, and I have to say, I really hated my life back then because you know, severe hypoglycemia. I was in the hospital 24 times over 12 years, but you wouldn't have known to talk to me that I hated my life because even like today, I think when you're a patient, you try to make things look, you know, like you're handling it and so forth. And I think we all need to think about that as well when we think about the, um, all of the behavior problems. Anyway, 24 times in 12 years, I was in the ER. And I actually wasn't in the ER as well um, after I went off of NPH. And, you know, and I know a lot of people can benefit from NPH, and I certainly know in the world I am really lucky that I don't have to be on NPH anymore. Um, you know, it's funny when I say this, I, I always say, oh, the day I went off of NPH. I remember a very early conference that I went to at Close Concerns in um, Puerto Rico and hearing Earl Hurst say NPH is from the devil. Um, you know, back then I think we didn't really know how to think about insulin stability and things like that. And I always just thought things were my fault. And I think as we, you know, begin to think about how patients can really most benefit from the amazing strides that have been made on the therapy and technology sides, we have to think about that, how there we can actually start to change, help them at change behavior. And that's one of the things that I think that digital can do. Um, anyway, so, but back then, access to information was basically my doctor and the library was right in front of, this is actually my dorm, um, and the library was right to the right of it. That's where I went for information on diabetes when I had to get it and really had to go read medical textbooks and figure out my life. And that was a really different time. And I think that as we think about the changes today would have been the biggest ones, it's actually access to information. 
Um, so I gave a talk at the Endo Society um, last fall where I was asked to speak about um, the conference was on emerging, um, it was a, more of a policy conference, but the talk was on emerging therapies and research needed to improve outcomes. We have come so far in getting the technology and getting the therapies, and now it's much more about bringing a, a coordinated approach together, I think. So um, when I think um, at that conference, someone asked me what have the biggest changes been since you were diagnosed, and it was a really interesting question. Of course, insulin analogs, you know, and of course, CGM and improvements in blood glucose monitoring. You know, this has made a very big difference since, the, since I was first diagnosed. So, you know, patients need to know where they are in order to figure out where they can go, right? And there's so much focus globally on cutting the number of strips and in not giving access to good technology, and we really need to think about how to give people the information that they need in order to um, actually be able to influence their care. So I want to say, um, so, you know, insulin being really different and it being easier to get information, yes. But the, the biggest other change um, is really, you know, who I have to talk to. And, you know, a fancier way of saying that is just greater connectivity. You know, we've, we've finally entered the digital era. So there's access not only to information, but to insights. There's buddies online. There's people I can learn from. There's people I can sympathize with. I have people I can see outside of the two hours a year that I get to see Dr. Nancy Bohannon in San Francisco, who's my fabulous doctor. But I think that's been the biggest change. And, you know, both my parents have, been, have, have died many years ago, but I think for them, that would have made an incredible difference. And as we think about what is driving clinical change and then how to make the connections to economic benefits, that is what will actually help getting rid of some of the anxiety and stress and being able to actually have changes in behavior um, made possible. Um, so this is really the main focus of the presentation. This new world of devices and screens has really fundamentally changed the way that we as patients interact with each other and our health and our healthcare teams. And there are a bunch of implications, really, for the way that diabetes care is delivered. So, um, and then there are also a bunch of critical challenges that I think we all need to think about together. Um, so just a bit of background, um, Close Concerns is a company that I founded in 2002, and this is exclusively focused on diabetes and obesity. And our mission is really to make the world smarter about diabetes and obesity. And my hope is that patients will benefit through better therapies and technologies and understanding as we can bring together the scientific and business and regulatory policy and advocacy knowledge to everyone who needs to know it. So, um, and I thank many, um, many of you in the room have been really supportive of Close Concerns for, for many years, and this is what has allowed us to grow. The pace at which we are getting information now is completely unlike it was in 2002. Um, this is uh, some of the amazing team. This is actually the whole team. Um, this is Close Concerns, our Dietary Foundation, as well as our sister company, DQ&A. Um, so this is really the whole um, group of people that put together, um, I think it's something like three million words. It's funny, the other day I actually said, you know, three million words, I've been saying that for a while. We should actually look and see if that's still true. And the number I got for last year was five million. And then I thought, oh, I can't have gone up to five million. That is so much. Um, but I guess as we look at the growth, we went to almost 50 conferences last year and we went to eight conferences the first year that um, Close Concerns was around. And we found every single conference that was possible. Um, and so some of the idea is, going to the conferences and being able to listen and then connect the dots for all of the people out there that are supporting us. Um, providing a platform for young healthcare leaders is incredibly important to us. So over 100 people apply for every spot that opens um, on our associate team every year. I think this year we actually have um, 300 people who applied for the one spot that's going to be open this year. And it is an amazing, amazing group of young people. What we all have to think about is how, when they are going off to medical school and to PhD programs, which is primarily what they do, how to keep them 
really interested in diabetes. To them, there is no more interesting world than this. They are working on the two biggest public health problems that exist. But when it actually gets to medical school and when they think about what they're learning there and what they are facing coming out, um, that's, that's when it gets pretty depressing for our young people. Um, this was great. Bob talked about our foundation, so I won't go too much um, more into that. And this is just a shot of the website um, for the Diatribe homepage. What's funny about this is, so, you know, I, I have all these statistics that I'm always supposed to say, like 400,000 people visited this website in the last year. And, you know, all of us in the diabetes community um, who write about diabetes, there are many, many patients who do today. I think we all have our little ways of, of trying to make what we do look really big. I mean, 400,000 is nothing compared to how many patients there are and how many family members and all of that. And this really gets at a lot of what I want to talk about. Um, about the connections that we need to make as a community on the behavior front, again, to really be able to drive clinical change and see those economic benefits, we're going to have to change some of the behavior and some of the incentives. A lot of us in the diabetes community are doing, um, I think, what, what we can say is some good work on patient education, but the, um, we really have to work a lot more on the incentives, right? So... Um, this is just an outline of the presentation, so I'm going to fly through some of the challenges. The challenges are not new to any of us, right, at a patient level, at a provider level, or at a system level. I do think if we think more about the challenges at the system level, we'll learn more about what we can do at the patient level. Again, to change behavior, behavior being changed can get us to better clinical outcomes, and boy, do we need to see better clinical outcomes in order um, to be able to get our care paid for and to be able to do better as patients. And all of the governments of the world obviously need us to do better at patients. Um, then I'm going to highlight some of the digital tools and technologies that I think can address um, some of these challenges. And at the end of that section, I would really love to hear from you. Um, we would love to know, what would your vision of a redesigned model of diabetes look like? We're going to be putting up some pages um, during cocktail hour and there are going to be some prizes um, for people who help participate in that. Uh, so we'd like to make that interactive in a couple of different ways. And then last, I'm going to talk about the key challenges that Leia had for digital diabetes care. So um, we are uh, obviously, as patients, to be a patient is actually a lot harder than it looks. Everybody here knows this, so I'm not going to spend much time here, but I think it is important to say that I don't think society realizes that, and I don't think the urgency of diabetes is very well um, shown in the media, right? So there are... Um, a lot of things that make insulin hard, but a lot of things that also make other drugs hard um, that are associated with hypoglycemia and so forth. And I think that has been um, really underplayed. A along with this, the therapy overload, again, I think this looks easy from the outside. And I think as patients, we're not really... Uh, very eager to talk sometimes about how challenging this is. Um, but if we want to know actually what is prompting people, particularly like the most costly 1%, 10%, 20%, that's where so much of the money is being spent. What is actually making things hard for them? It has a lot to do with behavioral issues that we do think um, can be addressed with digital, some of the digital strides. What's interesting about this to me, I, we've been very lucky in the diabetes community that simpler drugs have come out, especially for type 2 patients, over the last few years. We also still see a ton of adherence problems with those drugs. So it's, they're better, but they're not, um, it, that is not the whole solution. So again, more coordination by different um, parts of the diabetes community working um, more closely together so that patients aren't just blowing off taking pills and even blowing off their diabetes. Um, wholly. That, that complexity that patients have, that is directly affecting doctors and it is directly affecting the system as well. Um, same thing on stigma. So we gave, um, we had a poster last year at ADA. This was in collaboration um, with DQ&A, our, our um, sister market research company. Some of the, the data on stigma was really surprising even to us. So at DQ&A, we survey about 12,000 patients every quarter. This is primarily North American um, based right now. Um, 
it's really nice to be able to have this panel so that we can go to them almost at any time and see how they're thinking, not just about their therapy or the technology that they're using, but even about their relationship with their doctors, et cetera. And so um, if, I won't go through the, all of the results here, but just to say, you know, perhaps the most concerning thing here that was that stigma was highest in those with the worst, just in the worst shape, right? So those with higher A1Cs, those with higher BMIs, um, those in worse self-reported diabetes control. Um, if you're interested, you can go to diatribe.org slash stigma poster, or you can just email me and I'll send it to you. Um, but this is really depressing, right? So if people feel alone, they may be more likely not to take good care of themselves, and that's very negative, again, from a system perspective as well as from an individual and family perspective. I think sometimes in the U.S., and this is probably true globally as well, you know, sometimes we hear things about, oh, you know, making things easier for patients and it goes to a higher quality of life. Who really cares? Like, we only really care about how the patients are doing. But this is, this is all very, um, you know, this is really all very connected. Um, no discussion of patient problems um, would be complete, of course, without highlighting the toxic environment that we live in. So how can people with diabetes make the right decisions when the default options are really so egregiously bad for glucose control? Um, these pictures were taken at diabetes and obesity conferences in 2014. Um, so not EASD, um, although I think one of these is from Sci Sessions. I gotta say, Bob is paying attention to us here. Um, no, I, I, this is, but this is the food that is being offered to attendees at all of these meetings, and you guys know it. You guys know, like, fly, especially in the U.S., like flying through Chicago is like a freaking war zone, right? In terms of of, of what patients actually have as choices. So, you know, we gotta remember, patients are responsible for making the right choices, but our system is steering them toward the wrong ones. Okay, so to close out this part on patient problems, just here are some of the key challenges um, that patients are facing. And I'm stressing this because if we're all super focused on costs, you know, let's not miss the forest for the trees and worry only about drug or device costs. So let's think about all the costs that stem from these problems, right? So good control is very tough. If you, if you have diabetes, you probably got other major challenges. You know, many people, it is education. They don't realize how serious diabetes is. Maybe the people around them don't realize how serious it is. Um, the complexity of the therapies, again, that is a really troubling piece. And this move to greater simplicity, I'm so excited to see some of the strides that are being made. And we know that that's not all we need, but it's, 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 it's really important to see because we think it will be tied to better outcomes. We need to make sure that all of the trials, of course, are designed so that they can actually show this. Um, but the complexity is, is a piece that I'm glad so many of you are really um, focused on reducing. Um, one of the really hard things I think about adherence is diabetes just isn't painful. You know, we joke all the time about about how great it would actually be if hyperglycemia were painful. You know, I mean, we've even asked drug developers, like, could they make that happen? I mean, we probably would do better as patients if we had that to respond to. But not having any immediate threat or pain is something that is problematic for patients. And we also think this is part of the problem in the media, how diabetes is, is even um, portrayed, right? Um, again, patients don't necessarily have help on the behavioral front. Sometimes people might not even, you know, maybe it's not even obvious that they need help on the behavioral front. Many of them have psychosocial problems, um, and some of those might be invisible. For, for many patients, costs are too high. Um, you know, and again, most of us are in an environment that is working against um, wellness and against good diabetes management. So, you know, we've already heard today about a lot of the problems with shortages. Um, we're very worried about this in the U.S. in particular because this isn't just on the endo, 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 endocrinologist front. This is also on the primary care front. And again, I just look at my team. You know, we have had 24 people leave close concerns, go to medical school. They're at the top of their classes. They can get any residencies they want, and they are going toward things like radiation oncology, and they're going to cardiology, and they're going to procedure-based medicines. And it's not because... They're, going, they're only going to these places because it'll help them pay off their medical school loans. It's because they don't necessarily feel like they can even be successful, right? So if we think it is bad now, we only have to look at what's happening. Um, I think that, you know, the, the, the shortage means we're asking providers to do more in less time. That's not a good thing. 
Um, I think that uh, we, we, we can say um, a lot about this issue. Um, Lutz and I were talking earlier just about, um, you know, this, is, uh, this, this, this thing of not having enough time really also means that, so what are the implications? You know, diabetes has no positive image. You know, we know that this is a problem in the U.S. We know this is a problem in Europe. Um, oh, that's so funny. You know, I promised my husband, my husband's English. He said, please don't say Europe, like the country of Europe. Americans say that all the time. I know throughout all of the countries here, though, diabetes doesn't have a positive image. And, you know, as in Germany, as in the U.K., as in the U.S., the number of diabetologists is declining. Doctors don't have enough time. And all the while, obviously, the number of patients are, is, in, is increasing, as you can see on this. And again, you know, who's going to care for the patients who are in continents other um, than ours is also very troubling. You know, places like China, India, Africa, the Middle East, the shortage of providers is even more pointed um, than it is throughout many of the places that we live. Um, so this is, um, this is, you know, from, from Earl Hirsch, many of you might have seen this piece. Um, uh, he, he summarizes his rants on diabetes every year in DT&T. You know, there is not a more um, committed doctor probably on the planet. So when he's talking about the increased demands of payers, the emergence of electronic medical records, like we have to get there. We have to be able to use big data, um, but it's pretty depressing where this stands right now, right? Um, in many, uh, in, 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 in many other industries, you would just say invest more money. But look, we can't invest more money. There's already one in nine global healthcare dollars is spent on diabetes. This is approaching half a trillion dollars globally. We are maxed out. We need to be able to identify waste. I would actually like to see this as an area where more patients are helping. If we can help identify waste and better use the funds that we have available, that is great. Um, on the other hand, as far as prevention goes, prevention of diabetes, prevention of complications, we obviously are going to have to spend more before we spend less. And this is a very worrying um, theme. I'm, um, I'm thinking, you know, forget cost effective. We really do need cost saving care. Um, and I think this is really going to be important for us to point out um, to the larger global community, people who could help us address some of these challenges, right? So you got here basically what's a perfect storm. Um, this is confronting us in diabetes and also in healthcare more broadly. There's more patients. There's a shortage of providers. They all don't have enough time to spend with patients. The system is maxed out on costs, uh, meaning that thoughtful investments are a lot harder to justify. So, of course, this is the lead into, you know, what can we do about it? Is there an umbrella and raincoat, if you will, um, for the storm that we're facing? Well, you know, maybe there's some help to be found in the new diabetes care approaches in this digital era. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to go through some of the ideas and, and, and concepts um, that we think are you know, could be promising. So each is an additional tool in the toolbox. We need a really big toolkit to confront something as big and challenging as the global diabetes epidemic. And so, you know, I completely uh, encourage you and welcome you to be skeptical um, because again, between uh, sections two and three, uh, I'd like to ask you to, be, to envision the future of diabetes care, so. Um, all right, so first, first we do have to equip patients with excellent tools to better manage their own condition, especially, this is, this is more and more true because providers aren't available um, as much as they were before. So on the left-hand side here, um, you can see Abbott's Freestyle Libra. So this has gotten really strong reviews um, throughout Europe. We, of course, in the U.S. don't have access to this yet. The FDA has, has, has certainly Im improved. I would agree with many of the comments that we're hearing on the regulatory front. Um, but, but, this, but this is really interesting. This is a tool that is a lot simpler to use. And we're, I don't think we're really close in the U.S. to getting it. And um, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in, uh, in terms of talking about the, the EU regulatory landscape. There are some things that are, um, that are good about it. So 
the cool thing here, I think, with this product is that this is really enabling um, therapeutic change. So it's making it easier for patients to actually see what's going on and also making it easier for providers. Just from a democratic perspective, I also just really like it that it doesn't cost more to the more that you look at your blood glucose, right? So the, the technology costs more than using two strips a day or something like that, but I think you're putting patients in a, in a tough spot when they can't... Um, you know, when they have to actually pay more to use more strips and so forth. That's one of the things about CGM that I've also really liked. So uh, I think making this easy, um, making um, change easier for doctors to identify is good. And I understand the training is really, um, is, is ramping up on this front throughout Europe. Um, so the picture on the right, this is um, uh, Dexcom CGM data on the upcoming Apple Watch, um, which is going to be available in April. Um, one thing that is amazing about this is just that, I mean, there is such, there's such a boom going on in technology. We, our team, you know, we're all in San Francisco. We're in the middle of, uh, and very near Silicon Valley. And, you know, only two years ago, people were saying Apple, like being involved in, in diabetes or Google, like freaking forget it, you know, because they do not want to deal with the regulation and so forth. And I actually really um, credit FDA in a huge way um, for some of the strides that they have made. Um, Dexcom has also, there's probably not a company that has been smarter or savvier about the way that they've worked with FDA. You know, but so here we see this fast timing is possible because the watch app is going to function as a secondary um, display. And uh, we'll go more into this in a bit, but giving patients the um, ability to follow their own CGM data so that they can actually see very easily with their phones what is happening. Oh, that is what happens when I go for a walk or go for a run or when I eat um, this or that is, is, is fantastic. So I think... Um, what I want to say about these devices in particular, um, they really symbolize several pretty important facets about the future of diabetes care as we might see it as patients. So the more data and devices can fit into our lives in a seamless, simple way, the better. And again, that's not because that makes my life just like rosier. That's because that actually leads to better clinical outcomes. And then we can tie that to economic benefits. Obviously, the trials are going to have to be all done in the right way. But it's, I want to get away from this idea that the outside world sees as just convenience is more expensive. It's actually going to be less expensive if things go the way we think. Um, when you give real-time feedback on diabetes, and especially this is for people who are taking insulin, um, but as Every patient is staying older longer, so there are more patients certainly who will be and should be taking insulin. I think then patients can make better decisions and understand the cause of out-of-range blood glucose levels. So these are not all conversations that have to be done with healthcare providers just because we, we know that they can't be. So that tighter feedback loop is really critical to diabetes management and a real hallmark of the future of digital diabetes care. Then the other piece is that these uh, promises are really going to equip loved ones, healthcare providers, and payers with more information to reach out to patients who are at high risk of a severe event. And a move in this direction hopefully means lower costs in the long run. Again, this will have to be proven. Um, but, you know, just as an aside, the whole partner thing and parent thing and all of that is, is, is really hard. I mean, I know my husband just tiptoes around me. He has like 70 different ways of saying, oh, sh Huh, should you check your blood glucose or should we check your blood glucose now, et cetera, et cetera. CGM has actually made it a lot easier, but getting it on the iPhone, that is really a fantastic thing. I, I think it's probably actually much harder to be a partner or a parent or a kid with their own parents having diabetes, and I think that's really not well understood. And again, making life better for them, is that's not about just making life more convenient. That is about prompting better clinical outcomes. Um, so on the provider side, um, to pick up some of what Bob was talking about the, earlier today, um, we also do believe that a future is coming where data downloading gets easier for patients and providers. And he's completely right. Like No one is working. No one as patients is really downloading right now. Very few. There's been some early work from some of the pioneers like Diasend. You know, this was um, a picture sent by Dr. Bruce Buckingham from Stanford just a couple of days ago. And we just know if you don't have access to the data, you're sunk. And while this hasn't been fully solved, we really think we're on the right trend. So we've certainly seen more device, um, more, we've, we've seen more progress, particularly in glucose 
monitoring that seamlessly upload data to the cloud, saving providers time on the front end and wrestling sort of the core monsters and the multiple um, different software platforms. I think Bob is absolutely right. I um, tweeted this when you said this about interoperability, like we absolutely need it and we are moving much more quickly toward it. I think companies like Diascend and Gluco and the nonprofit Tide Pool um, in our neck of the woods in Silicon Valley, they're all hard at work on making the data upload easier. And meanwhile, on the type one front, JDRF has, has helped coordinate the publication of CGM standards for interoperability and PUMP and BGM standards are in the process. So this is gonna get better. It's still obviously a major need. To address some of the provider shortage and time constraints, it is really interesting looking at telehealth. And this is really taking off by leaps and bounds. You know, so, so what is telehealth? I mean, it is a really fair question. So is this, you know, seeing your provider on, on, on your computer? Is this seeing your provider on your, you know, smartphone? Is this texting? Is this emailing? I mean, probably all of these things count, right? And this is not to say at all that patients don't need to see their doctors. And even sometimes people make the shortcut, oh, well, if they're in good control, they don't need to see their doctors. Like, that's not true at all. Um, but it is all about, and Bob and I were talking about this at lunch, but really about, look, you probably can do a lot with data so that when you actually are face-to-face -face with the doctors, you can focus on what the problems are that you can't do over email and mobile and so forth. Um, I think that uh, it is also, though, true, we'd like more time from HCPs to be, to be untied so that they can work with the patients who need more time. And being able to identify the higher risk patients who do need more time are really important. So, um, you know, I, th I, think for, for, I think for many people, the promise of being able to connect with a doctor and not have to drive half an hour and get parking and all of that stuff, if you can actually get rid of some of that, that is really a positive. And, um, you know, and arguably, I think that's a positive on the provider front as well. So, so in other words, we're talking about like texts working to supplement meetings, for example. Um, anything that can increase patient responsibility and motivation is a great thing on, on our front. So, um, this is, it's just, it's, so it's really interesting, again, not to be so North American based, but it's really interesting to look at what Kaiser is doing. So I talked to uh, Dr. Um, Duddle the other day who helps run diabetes there, and he basically said, look, we're not as good as we want to be on glucose control. He basically said we're in like the 75th percentile or something like that on HEDIS. But he said um, that even though we're not the gold standard now, look, we see where this should be going. So they are doing many, many, many more e-visits, and and right now they're trying to get every Kaiser member on Kaiser email and so that they can actually get in touch with the nurse case managers. And it's been their experience that patients are really eager to work with the nurse case managers who they might, you know, envision as, as um, you know, people who are a little more sympathetic to their cause in some ways. So they do have access to the doctors, um, but they're also doing a lot at Kaiser for the doctors to work with nurses in a much more coordinated way, right? Um, so he said where they are headed is absolutely trying to partner every single physician with a care manager. It is um, true that this hasn't happened yet. The East Coast of Kaiser might be very different from the West Coast, um, but it's very cool to see um, uh, an organization like Kaiser, which we would argue is probably more like um, some of the governments here in the EU, they are keeping patients for a lot longer and they see the end game. And we hope that, um, we hope that they, they will be a model on this front. So he said, he said it's interesting, most of the time right now it's phone, how they're connecting. But he said email is, um, email is catching up, emailing and texting. So their goal is really um, to move control entirely into patient homes. With They want all of the glucose data so that they can contact patients when appropriate and they can actually be proactive. So it's not this treat-to-failure model, but it's actually like, oh, your A1C is going up from, you know, six to, to six to seven and a half. You know, it's not just intervening um, when the A1Cs are much higher. And um, really also, they're trying to work on giving patients support to teach them also how to control their own glucose. And office visits are then used for behavioral changes or problems not solved by the system. Um, so we thought that was pretty cool. Um, th there are also 
many small entrepreneurial companies working on this. You know, I actually got um, an app a couple of weeks ago called Doctors on Demand. We saw this at the Consumer Electronics Show. And, you know, sometimes this is, this is great. This was not for actually a diabetes um, problem that I was having. I just had a cold that I couldn't shake. And so I said, okay, let me just try this Doctors on Demand. So from the time I downloaded it to when I picked up um, Zithromax at Walgreens, our major pharmacy, was about 45 minutes. So downloaded it. They said, pay $40. Okay, I have had this cold over a week. This is too much pain. You know, I um, launched the app. And unbelievably, you know, and I, so I filled out all this stuff, and I filled it out once, right? So I never have to fill it out again except to say what's wrong. Um, the doctor call, you know, and I hear my iPhone rings. There's somebody in a white coat at the other end. We talk about it, and she's like, oh, you know, you probably want this, you want this prescription. I'm going to, I've already sent it to Walgreens on 24th and Castro because that's the one that's closest to you. And then I get a text from Walgreens, not very much longer. And I've got the medicine that I need. We're not saying that all of these problems, you know, diabetes obviously doesn't translate to such easy care, um, but moving more in this direction was pretty helpful. So is diabetes moving toward doctors training, um, you know, other caregivers to help people mobily to help, pe help people online, we do think it can make it a little more efficient. So um, we're obviously looking forward to a future where populations can be tracked and, and where the highest risk patients can be identified. So that can help avoid some really catastrophic events that drive healthcare costs. Some of the ER, you know, for severe hypo, ER uh, for DKA, things like that, because we know that many, many patients who have these problems have them over and over. We think that if thousands of patients can be tracked and the software can point out those who are likely to end up in the ER, you know, hopefully we can get to the point where we're avoiding those events entirely. So the caveat is that's a pretty different care model um, than what we have in the U.S. right now um, and probably much of, much of Europe. You know, the incentives are going to be really key to get right, and we're trying to look and see what the incentives are in different parts of um, Europe because the, um, the creators of the Affordable Care Act in the U.S. openly acknowledged, like, they didn't get the incentives right. That wasn't even really part of the Affordable Care Act when they, um, when they put that together. So right now, providers have zero time to look at streams of data flowing in. This has to be automated. The U.S. is far from doing it now, but we are looking toward European counterparts with excellent IT systems to really show us the way. Okay. Now, moving on to social media. So we get asked all the time how social media is impacting or could change diabetes care. And I think to frame the discussion, it's really critical to note just how massive it is and how quickly it's grown, right? So one in six people on the planet is on Facebook. And this is a website that if we were at this meeting 12 years ago, like no one had even, Facebook actually hadn't even started, right? So the same is true for YouTube. Um, this slide only makes the point, you know, social media has impressive global reach and it's grown incredibly quickly, how specifically relevant to diabetes is it, right? So you can certainly see social media is ubiquitous in the U.S. Um, these global, the global stats are not very different, though. And it's been really interesting to also see across age groups how much it's grown, right? So it's not just that 90% of 18 to 29-year-olds use, are using social networking, but over 65, it's, it's nearly half of those. And these numbers, we literally update this slide, you know, every few months in the way that this has grown is huge. So, you know, some of the takeaways that we think about as far as social media goes, lots of direct and broad interaction with the diet, what we call the diabetes online community, basically anyone with diabetes who's going online. Um, this, there is a lot of different um, stuff going on, right? So some of it is Facebook. Some of it is people tweeting. Some of it is people using hashtags. Some of it is chats. Some of it is, you know, and, you know, believe me, there are some really some doctors who actually spend a lot of time online who are endocrinologists, who are primary care doctors, et cetera, who have real followings. So people with diabetes are also using their networks to get the word out about news, you know, unique opportunities and programs. We we know like 90% of what we know, for example, about different therapies and technologies that are approved in Europe and are not approved in the U.S. is because we get it online, right? And so it's not that we're saying every single person online who has diabetes is representative of every 
um, you know, of every patient over here, but there's a lot of good information that we have been able to get, and there's a lot of good information that is shared among patients. So, you know, they're sharing interesting content. There's a forum for, there are forums for discussions and dialogue, and they just don't go to them if they don't like it. So, like, who's popular and who's good rises to the top, um, particularly on Facebook, the different discussions, and on um, Twitter. So, you know, there's an authenticity that I think patients really do appreciate, um, and they're certainly not just writing about um, about only diabetes. Um, but I think that they have many patients have have found um, some good support there. So we look at online at social media. So it's support, it's conversation, it's news and tips, um, and some of it is advocacy as well. And this is um, really interesting to think about. We, you know, we, we know there are different examples here that you can see where social media has helped people. Um, how many people here have heard of Night Scout as an example? You can raise your hands. Yeah, so, so in the US, this is really interesting. This is the power of social media. Um, this has been a, a really good example of grassroots action and patient advocacy. Um, what the Night Scout system does is it takes data from the Dexcom CGM receiver and it sends it to an Android, right? The data is then sent to a cloud and patients um, can actually show their data to others around them, and it's been, particularly, um, it's been particularly popular with parents who have problems with their kids at school and not being able to see their numbers, right? So this system was pretty do-it-yourself, but what was amazing, the system um, actually was not FDA approved until, until recently, and it was really a brainchild of parents who decided that they couldn't wait for the FDA to make these connected devices more available. So social media was really what enabled this to take off, and there is a a Facebook group that had, you know, over a thousand parents on it and so forth. And they were all just helping each other make this available. Now, FDA has actually said, oh, those are secondary numbers. Actually, this doesn't need approval. But that probably wouldn't have happened um, without all of the um, patient support behind it. So FDA downclassified this secondary display of CGM. And this is actually what is helping uh, you know, the regulatory and move a little bit faster. Now, Night Scout still will have to work very closely with Dexcom, um, who really holds, holds the keys here. Um, but this was, this was an exciting um, place to see, to see um, support happen and, and really to see some advocacy. So another one was um, Diatribe brought together a bunch of different patients to go talk to FDA last November. And so we put out a survey and within a week, largely due to help from JDRF and all kinds of people on social media. We had thousands of people who had filled out the survey. We took a book about this big, just with comments. They were answers to two questions. What do you want to see FDA do? And you know, within a week, we put together a book that thick and took it to FDA, and they loved it. They were very supportive of it and said, this helps us so much. You know, And so being in less of an adversarial role and more of a how can we help you is great. Um, the ADA has been, you know, hugely helpful on the social media front because they have more followers on Twitter, as an example, than anyone else does. And so I think that this was really a clear reminder to us because it's been hard to engage patients one by one, um, even for something as uncontroversial as sharing patient perspective, still by doing things electronically like these surveys and being able to turn around data quickly, um, this really helps. Uh, this really helps out at at, at uh, you know things like the the FDA. So another way that people have used social media is really to show personal experiences of um, new products, um, new therapies, new technologies, et cetera. Um, this is conversation. This is news, tips, um, and it spans a pretty broad range. So um, I think as patients, we just want people to understand us. And so if we can share some views, um, that's great. So these were tweets that I sent out um, when I was on, in a bionic pancreas study. And Many people would love to be in studies like this. I was really lucky that I got to go to Boston and um, to be in Steve Russell and Ed Damiano's study, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow. But the fact that I could actually share what was happening was amazing. And that's been also a really big change that people can get out information about technologies and therapies that are coming, right? So another way um, to share how I was really feeling um, in real time and what 
you know, another, another just piece of this that was so interesting, I think even my family being able to see how I was feeling, you know, in this trial when I was really far away from them um, was great. I think also social media, it can also really free patients to talk about some of the harder parts about diabetes, like wanting to quit, you know, like making tough eating choices, like being scared of appointments. And we've heard a lot of doctors actually say that they spend some time on social media and actually understand their patients a lot better than they maybe do through the day-to-day -day appointments, right? Um, so hashtag walk with D, I don't know. Um, if, you want an, if you want one example of a campaign on Twitter, you don't even have to be on Twitter. You just go to Twitter.com and put in hashtag, that's the number sign, walk with D, and you'll see a lot about patients sharing their lives um, about diabetes. And I think patients love this and probably feel more motivated um, because they're part of a community, right? So this all goes to say, we think there's a lot to be said for social media, for patients feeling less isolated. Um, but it is really also important to know that even though the diabetes online community is really helpful to patients, still, when you go back to it, what is the number one way that patients get information and insights? It is still from their doctors, right? And patients still overwhelmingly look to their healthcare providers with online resources they're still a pretty, pretty distant second. So this data comes from DQ&A. They surveyed over 10,000 patients, and um, they saw overwhelmingly type 1 and type 2. The, the doctor or their CDE was really where they got information about managing and living with diabetes. So with that in mind, I guess we would ask, how, so how could you engage providers in the digital era? So one idea is through prescribing apps. I think we're still at very early stage of apps. There was a Twitter chat recently where someone asked, like, I don't know, over 100 people, what app are you using the most? All of us had diabetes. And you know, you could hear a pin drop, um, right? There's, there's, we're still in very early stages. I think that um, some, of the, some of the wellness and exercise apps have, sh have shown some, you know, have shown some, uh, some emergence over the last couple of years, and there is definitely a ton of interest in this. Um, one is WellDoc's mobile prescription app. Um, so this is all about giving people real-time texts um, to show how they might change their behavior. And doctors can write prescriptions for Blue Star. Patients download the app. This is mostly through employers. This is in the US only. Um, it sort of takes aspects of the drug and device model and brings it to software. Um, and this is being reimbursed by some insurance companies in the US. Um, but I think that we would like to see more investment in this area. And we know that the investment in digital um, in the US, I think has actually tripled over the last year, investment in healthcare um, and, uh, and digital software and apps. So that said, this stuff still requires a huge amount of manual entry by patients, which is just a showstopper for so many people. So it's early days of commercialization. We'll have to see how how engagement looks over the long term. Um, I think the idea of prescribed apps is really nice, though. You know, even if doctors are just prescribing um, things like exercise, things that they actually think can get at some of the behavioral side, right? So when we think big picture, digital diabetes holds a lot of promise to collect better data on patients. Um, but it is also clear there's no time or payment, again, for providers to look for it. That's true in the US. That's true in Europe. Not at this point. Um, we hope one day to get to a world where data is collected automatically and then analyzed automatically so that they can generate recommendations for providers. And this is where the field has got to go, right? So diabetes is still kind of stuck at the first step which is just collecting the data without any hassle. But in the future, we hope to see better use of software to recognize patterns, making therapy recommendations, um, and helping patients and providers sort through that complexity um, that is managing data. And why? So we want that to lead to tighter feedback loops. And when I say we, I just mean like kind of the, 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 the diabetic Roddy that is focused in this area, right? Um, that's a really big problem right now in diabetes that the, the feedback loops just aren't fast enough or tight enough. So we measure and analyze and make changes pretty slowly, right? 
So we need systems that will allow data to be turned into information to make actionable change. Like we said, we have seen some therapies and technologies that are better at that um, come out in the last year or so, and that's a really good thing. We also would just say we don't want these changes just to be made when people go in and see their doctors. And this whole thing of, you know, only four times a year, I mean, that's a myth anyway. People are not going to see their doctors um, or healthcare providers nearly that often um, in most cases. So we would like to see more of this happen mindlessly with minimal um, provider effort and um, patient effort in a system that will pay for it. Digital diabetes care has the potential to help patients and providers cycle through the diagram, this diagram, much faster. Um, and that would result in better outcomes for patients, we would hope, and lower costs for the healthcare system. Um, this, all of this data, of course, is very important to capture. The trials have to be designed in the right way so that you actually can show the clinical change and so you can translate that um, to economic benefits, right? So, um, all right, so I have about 10 minutes left. We wanted to just say we've been um, given permission during cocktail hour to put up some of these questions on the wall. And I wanted to just do a quick vote right now. I think we get to put three of them up and then um, we're gonna go around and try to get you to answer some of them. Um, but what, which of these questions do you think this group would be able to mo most helpfully answer? People can just call, call them out. Um, we want you to think about redesigning diabetes care. And one of the reasons behind this is because we know, especially in the U.S., there is not nearly enough funding going toward some of the really interesting things that could happen on the digital diabetes front. We'd like to see more pilots happening. We think there is a chance for this to happen if we can persuade more foundations to be involved. So we know the Helmsley Charitable Trust has been incredibly generous. We would like to see many more foundations come in and to be able to see that they could make changes in this area happen. Sometimes people in the U.S. complain, for example, that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does not give any money to diabetes. I mean, so the fact that they funded malaria and figured out how to fix it, that's not just because like a neighbor wanted them to work on malaria. That is because some really good pilots were done. And this was shown that they could actually address malaria in a very real, tangible way. We're all dealing with problems of governments paying much less money for R&D. And so we really do think that we can get some foundations involved. Um, so I don't know, can people call out um, which of these questions that uh, you guys would be interested in answering at the break? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna write these down. Um, this is all obviously not uh, it just will be really brainstorming. I think that um, so would that be that that would be how patients can access caregivers more easily? Yeah. Okay, that's good. Other other ones that people or they went around. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, that's pretty cool. In the um, any, any other ideas of which of these questions would be the most valuable to come out um, with some of your answers on? Dr. In, Bolton, in Dr. Ratner. In person versus virtual, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we love it that EASD is letting us set up cocktail hour like this, so thank you. Um, the last part of this, I'm just going to go through some of the challenges so that you can see that uh, we are realistic, right? So we all know that physician burnout is all too real. We know patient adoption, you know, has some, some very big issues. We know that a lot has to improve to make digital health relevant and meaningful, right? Um, on the regulatory front, Previously, we think regula regulation was a much bigger roadblock than it has been now. As Bob described, the FDA has taken a more hands-off approach to digital health. Um, we're very happy about some of the changes that have happened there. But still, there is a bit of a gray area on whether an app treats and manages a disease, in which case it would be regulated. Um, we think that the most useful digital solutions in diabetes probably are going to require some regulatory approval. So uh, just striking a balance there between regulating successfully and interfering with innovation, that's a, that's a tough one, right? Um, we're going to be looking toward also how do you scale? So business models obviously need to scale to bring massive change. So we all know that. We've talked about that for a while. I don't know if we necessarily acknowledge enough that to scale, 
in such a heterogeneous set of populations is pretty challenging, right? So, you know, it's a lot easier to provide a tool to 10 people than 100, than 100,000, than a million. The technology needs to be deployable, and that is really hard in, in such different populations. Um, and that makes sense for everybody. So, you know, the patient, the companies, the healthcare systems. Challenge six, this applies to obviously every area in diabetes, but especially to new technology. And, um, you know, obviously we, we've talked a lot about what, what is the data that's needed. What I've noticed is the data requirements are just getting harder and harder every year. It's a tough challenge and very few have hit a home run on this, right? Um, reimbursement, obviously, there's a, like every story that we write, there's the reimbursement piece of it. So the best technology means nothing unless, you know, people can afford it. This basically puts the pressure on digital solution developers. They've got to start with this in mind. How is this going to be paid for and how can change be created? Um, the last challenge is just fragmentation, you know. So to illustrate, these are the results of a system mapping exercise that we did at Diatribe a few weeks ago, right? And um, look, we already thought we knew that the system was really fragmented, but when we actually sat down to say, okay, who are the stakeholders in diabetes and what are they doing? Like, we were pretty amazed at even how much more fragmented than we, you know, we thought we knew all of this stuff. Um, few entities are really working together and everyone has an agenda, which is great for causes, but it amounts to many little splashes in the ocean rather than one giant wave and coordination could really do a lot to help us. So just some quick concluding thoughts um, to summarize and wrap up. You know, we've got a perfect storm. Digital approaches have potential. The key challenges are many and, you know, a more coordinated approach is an absolute must. Um, I do think that these are, you know, as we think about digital health and what could happen, these are all tools in a toolbox. We really need a big toolbox to fight this stuff. So digital health is not going to solve everything by any stretch, and it won't be for every patient or every provider. But the problems are so massive that it doesn't really matter, right? So, you know, many do believe that the next frontier in diabetes is behavior and incentive and system changes. You know, another drug or another new therapy is not going to solve the problems that we're facing at this point because we've come a really, really far way. And so let's figure out how to employ better drugs and better technologies. So, you know, how we, how, how do we get providers to care about a disease that is losing them money and is a nightmare to deal with is a big question. How do we get a system to invest over the long term? I guess, you know, these are the questions that keep me up at night, um, and these are the questions that I'm going to be asking for your help with um, as we all sip some cocktails together later this afternoon. Thank you very much. We're open for questions. Let, let me start, Kelly, by asking you, how concerned is the patient community about privacy issues with all of this e-commerce with data? And similarly, how concerned are they about cybersecurity? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. I don't actually, I don't know the answer to that. That's something that we should put to our um, DQ&A panel, and I'm going to make a note to do that. I don't, I don't know. Does anyone um, out there, I mean, I have impressions that you know, this is probably just um, a, a more and more mounting concern, but is it worth the trade-off of being able to connect online? And I would say things are only getting better in terms of the benefits, um, but it's a really good question. I'll have to come back to you after we do some data, but see, isn't that cool? He can ask me a question. I can say, we're going to put that in our survey on March 1st. Um, so I will, and I'm sorry I don't have a good answer. Does anyone out here have an answer for that question? Yeah, patients more afraid. Yes. Wim, please. Um, I can shout. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't uh, hear the answer from my colleague in the Netherlands, but internationally it's coming worse because of the non acceptance by the societies in the world that someone has diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we are fighting, even, even they are saying, 
for uh, pilots uh, in Canada, pilots with diabetes type wow, 1, insulin crazy. dependent, are allowed to fly with strict control with mm -hmm. all things, but in other countries not. And if a pilot gets diabetes, he will hide it because he will lose his job. And I guarantee all of you that one of you who is flying back home tomorrow, that he will have a pilot with diabetes. I know several of them who are hiding it because mm -hmm. society is not accepting it. Because of the discrimination and the people no, viewing not, it as no, a character it's, flaw. It's really worse, worse, worse. Because a lot of people in the world are hiding, mm -hmm. are not yeah. coming out, and we can learn from the people with HIV AIDS. For several years ago, they are coming out, and they have now a much better position than a lot yeah. of people with diabetes who are hiding it. There's no communication, and oh yeah, until suicide or something uh, like that, because the society is not accepting. And your uh, story, I can imagine, and that you are coming out so enthusiastically, uh, uh, but I must, I didn't know what the answer uh, from, uh, from you were, I didn't hear it, but uh, I think that she was always saying a little bit how difficult it is in the community, also in the Netherlands. Yeah, I, th I think also there is um, uh, Mike, um, oh, I was mangled his last name, Manning Yellow, I think, um, is an amazing, um, amazingly smart person on policy in the U.S. and has really talked to just a few of us in the diabetes community about the amazing strides that have been made on the HIV AIDS front. And he's basically saying to us as advocates, you know, in the U.S., they're just checking your box when we talk about, you know. The the same. No, no, I, I don't know because they are hiding them themselves. Yeah, we're actually in violent agreement here. Um, <laughs> he's actually telling us as advocates that we actually need to do a lot more, but there is so much discrimination and so forth that it's viewed as a character flaw, having diabetes, so people n aren't even necessarily coming out. But I think it's a, a really good question that we, should, um, that we should just ask in our next survey. Any additional questions, please? Yeah, I think one other very key issue which um, is not getting recognized generally in all of this whenever big data is mentioned and you know, no offense, but when we go from a box that's data, analyze decisions, um, th there needs to be methodology behind all of this and models and uh, otherwise we may end up getting what we think is information but is actually very misleading. So, you know, what I, the kinds of things that I think are really important for people to acknowledge are the um, importance of the methodologies of informatics, epidemiology mm -hmm. and other disciplines. Unfortunately, because of the power of media, who yeah. mostly do not know what they're talking about, we're living in a world where it seems like we can kind of go around all that old methodology and it doesn't matter. And that's absolutely not the case. So I just think I just wanted to flag thank you. That yeah, that's point. it's a really it's a helpful comment. Where could we? Where do you think that diabetes could learn the most from? Like what other areas um, that have done this well? I mean, we can talk well, afterwards, but in, I don't in, think anyone would disagree I'm, I'm very, with that. This is a topic I'm very passionate about okay. as as an ex statistician, yeah. um, and uh, I mean, yeah, this one thing I despair about is the lack of good information. Okay. One uh, thing I did share in my company recently was an article by a guy called Tim Harford who wrote in the Financial Times, an extremely good article a year ago, to make this very point. So it's not that big data is all wrong, that's not my message, mm -hmm. but it's that we have to uh, acknowledge the importance of uh, proper methodology to get useful information. 
Yeah, thank you for this. You know, it's probably one of these things, I don't even know what I don't know on this front, mm. so I would love to talk no, to you I'm afterwards. And also, talk. this is my work. I go around and listen yeah. to really smart people, and then I grill them about, you know, what yeah. the world needs yeah, to know. I'm so I'm happy to talk I'd love and, to talk to you and afterwards. And just thank for you. Tim Harford's article, Financial Times, March last year. In March 10 14. minutes, you will learn much more than you probably know about big data uh, today. More mm -hmm. useful information. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd really like to congratulate for your advocacy. It's a really passionate and it's very important, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, one thing that you pointed out in your last slide is the need also to prove the efficacy of all these uh, 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 potential applications and so on and so forth, which may raise an issue because the number of apps is yeah. growing up so fast without any control with some uh, business yeah. interest. How can we build up programs that really could, in a scientific and solid manner, evaluate the efficacy of these potential applications and, and, and what is the real impact in the glycemic control in the outcome of the many patients with diabetes? So, this is, yeah, this is such a good question, right? I mean, the digital age is bringing a lot of requirements and there are declining resources. This is a big piece of why our foundation really does want to bring in very smart um, and well-resourced foundations to help us with this stuff. I think the good news is, you know, I mean, when I started Close Concerns in 2002, when I was diagnosed there were 30 million people globally with diabetes, right? So in, in the world, now there are 30 million just in the U.S. So I think we do have an ability, and especially as advocates, to increase the urgency so that we can actually show what can be done. And I don't know if the best place is to actually look at governments to fund this. I certainly know in the U.S. there is zero interest in passing anything in Congress that costs any money. But I do think what's really cool, I mean, this we are going through a period of unprecedented wealth creation on the technology front. And so if we put that together with what actually can change, just looking at what Apple and Google are trying to do in diabetes, and they are saying there's a lot that they don't know. And so it is up to us to get a really coordinated effort to tell them what they can help us with. And I think for them, being able to see these sorts of changes that they could make is great. And I think they would understand this problem much better probably than some of us in the diabetes community. So thank you for raising that. So one of the advantages of social media is the, the breadth, that the number of people that you can reach. It's also one of the potential dangers in the fact that there's yeah. so much information. How do we vet the information that's online for reliability, validity, and safety? Mm -hmm. I, you know, Bob, I don't have a good answer for that either. I think um, that one thing that has work to some extent is just the sheer numbers. You know, we all know people in the diabetes online community who say really disparaging things and they just don't tend to get followers, you know? And so it's just the law of large numbers and small numbers. And it's like, okay, well, you know, people aren't gonna go there. I, I think it does make it really, really important um, to, again, as a community, look and see how we can expand the resources coming in and focus on education and on bringing the right doctors and healthcare providers in to be able to try to address some of this, you know, and, and we must harness the media in a much better way because the way that we're doing it now is, is, um, is, is very depressing and it is not helpful to the community. So um, I am going to think about that question as well and maybe we'll put that one up for all of you to help us with during cocktails.